All right, so today we're going to be talking about one of the most unintuitive um, and unexpected paradoxes, according to me, and it's called the birthday paradox. And it's also an interesting um, problem to study because it involves probability and a bit of um, approximation that we learn in calculus. So to motivate the birthday paradox, I'm going to first cover the birthday problem. And the birthday problem essentially states that um, suppose we have n people, we have n people, what is the probability that at least two of those people share the same birthday. And before we get started on analyzing how we can potentially solve this problem, we're going to assume, um, we're going to assume that we only have 365 valid birthdays, so we're not going to um, worry, worry about leap years just because, um, one, it doesn't really add to, well, it doesn't really add any insight to the birthday paradox, and two, it's just like needless complexity um, that if you really wanted, you could uh, add in and solve the problem with that. So given that we have 365 valid birthdays and we have um, n people in, in a group, we want to find an expression in terms of n uh, that represents the probability that at least two of those people share the same birthday. And now when, when two of those people share the same birthday or like at, when we have at least two sharing the same birthday, that means like either two can share the same birthday, three people having the same, four all the way to all n people having the same birthday, right? So we could go in that way to calculate the n probability, but that's a lot of cases that we have to deal with. Um, and we kind of know that anytime we see this like at least two or that kind of terminology, an easy way to calculate the probability is through the use of complementary counting, right? And it seems that complementary counting is probably the best option in this case as well. Um, because the probability that at least two share the same birthday is the same as the probability um, or one because all probabilities have to add up to one, minus the probability that no one shares the same birthday. Because if no one shares the same birthday, that's just the same as everyone having, um, everyone's birthday falls on a different day. And therefore, uh, yeah, you don't have anyone sharing the same birthday, whereas at least two, at least two people sharing the same birthday includes like the fact that you have two people sharing it, um, two people having like one birthday together um, and accounts for all the cases of like all the other cases. So if we were to solve for this expression, we would get what we're originally uh, wanting to solve for. And now all that remains is us finding um, a value in terms of n for this probability of that no one shares the same birthday. So given we have n people, how will we go about the fact that, uh, to solve that no one shares the same birthday? Well, let's look at the first person. Um, the probability that they don't share a birthday with anyone is simply one, right? Because there's no one else in the pool. Um, so their birthday ha will be different from everyone else's. So we have one. And then the probability that the next person um, has a distinct birthday is simply one minus one over 365 because uh, as long as we don't, there's one over 365 is the probability that um, our second person has the same birthday as the first person. Um, and therefore, apart from that case, any other birthday would be a valid birthday uh, in this probability. And then like this kind of follows from that where the third person, the probability that they have a distinct birthday is just one minus the probability that they either have the same birthday as the first, second person or the first person. And that's just two over 365 since um, we already have two other people with the birthday. And we can kind of see that like if we kind of multiply all of these till the nth person, um, 
the probability that the nth person has a distinct birthday from the um the n minus one people before it is just one minus uh n minus one divided by three sixty five, and so that this this expression this product gives us the probability that no one shares the same birthday, and we kind of mentioned that to find the probability of at least two having the same birthday, we simply just subtract the term from one. So one minus one times one minus one over 365 times uh, one minus two over 365 times one minus three over 365 all the way to uh, one minus n minus one over 365. So this, this is the expression that solves the birthday problem, um, where given n people, this, this expression over here uh, tells us the probability that n or the probability that at least two people share the same birthday. And one thing that like like just the first thing that we notice off the bat is as n increases, the probability of two people sharing the same birthday also increases because since n is getting larger, um, what happens is we're multiplying terms and all of these terms are, except for like the first one, all these terms are less than zero, right? Or less than one. So we're multiplying, consistently multiplying decreasing terms and all of them are less than one. So our, com our complete product over here, which represents the probability that no one shares the same birthday, decreases with increasing n, right? So we know that product decreases with an increase in n, and therefore when we subtract one by a decreasing number, or when we subtract, when we subtract from one that decreasing number, this probability continues to increase. So we know that this increases with n um, increasing, right? And that's that's pretty intuitive, right? If we had fifty people in the same room there's a higher chance that two people will share the same birthday compared to just two people in the same room. Um, we kind of can understand that, that there's nothing um, off our intuition about that. And if you kind of know what the pigeonhole principle is, if we had 366 people in the room, like the chance that people uh, we have people sharing the same birthday has to be 100%, right? Because we only have 365 buckets if we're using pigeonhole principle terminology and we have 366 people. So clearly like as n increases, the probability of like people sharing the same birthday also increases, but we kind of want to understand at what rate, um, at what rate is this increase happening in? And that's where the birthday paradox comes into play. So the birthday paradox really asks, really asks, uh, it asks, what is n where our probability is greater than 50%? And if I, if I was going to restate the problem, we know that we have 365 uh, birthdays, like 365 different separate birthdays that can happen. And intuitively, you might expect that for our probability to be more than one half of someone sharing a birthday, we might need uh, at least 100 different or at least somewhere in the hundreds of people. Um, so that we have like two people, we have a really good chance that two people share the same birthday. But the birthday paradox, uh, when we solve for this, we'll, we get a pretty surprising result. So let's let's try to solve for this n value. And that's where the birthday paradox will come into play. We already know that the probability of at least two is equal to one minus um, one minus one times one minus one over 365 times one minus two over 365 dot 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 times one minus n minus one divided by 365, right? So that's the expression we have. And we want this to be greater than, or this probability to be greater than or equal to 50%. So what we're essentially solving for is this inequality, um, where we want the left side to be 0.5 and then this inequality sign. And now we need to sort of 
take this expression that we have and make it into a form that we can evaluate this inequality. And so one thing that we can do is we can get rid of this one over here and we can take it to the other side. So our inequality just becomes minus 0.5 is greater than or equal to uh, minus one times one minus one over 365 and then um, and minus one divided by 365 and then dividing by negative one we're essentially solving for 0.5 is less than or equal to um, one minus one over 365 time multiplied by one minus n minus one divided by 365 so we have kind of simplified our expression that we want to solve into this inequality and how, now what we need to do is try to find an easy way to solve for this one one way like one thing that you can notice is on the right hand side we have a product of a bunch of terms and anytime we have a product of a bunch of terms logarithms helps us switch products into sums and usually sums are easier to reason about than products so essentially what I have is um, the natural log of 0 0.5 is less than or equal to um, the natural log of this product. And because everything is under that natural log, that's just the same thing as the sum of the natural log of one minus K divided by 365, where, uh, our sum goes from k is equal to 1 to n minus 1. All right. So now we have sort of converted our problem into a bunch of sums of logarithms. And the reason why I said there's a bit of calculus or applications in this is that we can kind of make our lives easier by noticing that usually k will be a small number equals a small number because for large numbers first of all like let's say um let's say that we have a large number for example k like well well if n is a very large number if it's greater than 365 you already know that the probability is 100 percent right so that's what it approaches um and for very large numbers like even 364 362 etc etc we know that um we know that our probability, uh, our probability that we're trying to solve for is very close to one, if not like one itself. And so the only insightful area is where the numbers are relatively small. So when K is small, or which means when N is small, which implies that N is small, we know that this logarithm um, in a small, like, for a small um, n, we know that the Taylor series approximation for the log of 1 plus x is a good approximation for this. So the Taylor series approximation for this function is simply um, the log of the natural log of 1, which is 0, plus the first derivative, um, the first derivative of this function, which is just 1 divided by uh, 1 plus x times times um, x itself, right? So this is the first order approximation of um, this function that we're dealing with over here. And we already mentioned how the natural log of one is zero. And all we're left over with is just one uh, divided by one plus x times x. Now, we know that we're dealing with small x's like I said over here. And when we have a small x, this fraction over here is just close to one. So one divided by one plus x is about one. And we're just multiplying one by x. So one times x is just equal to x. So therefore, what this um, we can simplify this lo logarithm into just being about the sum from k is equal to one to n minus one of minus um, k over three sixty five. Because for small x's, so for small k over three sixty five our uh, first order Taylor approximate is just of that logarithm function is just X itself. And so now we have this new summation. We're saying that we're trying to solve for when the logarithm of 0 0.5 is less than or equal to the sum 
from k is equal to 1 to n minus 1 of negative k divided by 365. And this is just a um, arithmetic sequence that we're summing over. So we can, we have a closed form notation for this. And the closed form notation is just 1 over 365. And we're going from, we're just then summing 1 plus 2 all the way through n minus 1, right? And that, that closed form summation is simply n plus 1, where n is the last term. So that's just n times the number of terms, which is n minus 1, divided by 2. So now we have now we have a pretty simple equation to solve. We're essentially solving for this. We have arrived at um, the natural log of 0 0.5 is less than or equal to negative 1 over 365 times n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Let's do some further simplification. We can remove this negative sign um, by one second divided, dividing by negative 1. And what we get is um, the natural log of 2 is greater than or equal to 1 divided by 365 times 2 times n times n minus 1. And now we can finally remove the, uh, remove the logarithm from this left side and we can get um, we can get 2 is greater than or equal to e to the power of n times n minus 1 divided by 2 times 365. And therefore, uh, therefore, when we solve for, well, or actually, there's no reason to get rid of the natural log. When we solve for, uh, we can take this denominator to the other side and we get the natural log of 2 times 2 times 365 is equal to n times n minus 1. And if we were to solve for n in this case, we would get n is about 23. So re like kind of re um, summing up all the results we've seen is that if we have a room of 23 people the chance oops chance of sharing the same birthday of of anyone or someone chance of someone sharing the same birthday is greater than or equal to 50% and so the re like we kind of expected that this number would be much larger, maybe near the hundreds, right? Because we have 365 birthdays and out of that, like to have uh, a greater than 50% chance of sharing a birthday, like it seems at first reasonable that the number of people that would need in the room is somewhere in the high hundreds or maybe even like low hundreds, at least triple digits. But it turns out through this analysis, we only need 23 people. And now you have a greater than 53% chance or sorry, a greater than 50% chance that two out of those people will or like you'll have people that have the same like birthday in that room. And the fact that like the rate of growth of this probability is so high, um, like in other words, like we just need a few number of people for uh, the the probability to climb that fast is where the birthday paradox comes into play, where it doesn't seem like intuitive at first that only a few people, and in this case, 23 people are required uh, such that the chance of a collision, like in this, and a collision means like two people sharing the same birthday is this or is greater than 50%, but that turns out to be the case. And so, this has like a lot of implications, uh, especially in something called like collision resistance or like basically like implications in analysis of collision resistance. And collision resistance is basically 
the probability that out of a set of um, chance events, you don't have two of the events, two of the like, so like similar to what we had out of out of like a bunch of random variables, random events. Um, we want to make sure that no two of those random events share the same uh, sort of bucket or share the same value for the events. It turns out that if we want that to be the case, we need to really have the values that our events take on be much, much larger than, um, than the number of events that we have. And that all comes through this birthday paradox of the fact that the chance that two, um, like the chance that two random variables can take on the same value, it, given the number of random variables we have is much like it doesn't take many random variables to increase our chance of a collision. And if we were to kind of graph out, um, if we were to graph out N, and then this is the probability of collision. And this is again, where we have 365 different values. We would see like extremely fast growth in the beginning as N increases. And then we would get we would grow really fast towards almost a hundred percent chance. So the probability of collision becomes basically around one when we have around 50 people in the room. So there's a good chance that if you have 50 people that one, like two of those people share the same birthday or you have multiple people sharing the same birthday. And then this halfway point is around 23, like we analyzed before. So that's what the implication of the birthday paradox is. Like you have 365 different values that a random variable takes on. But even though this number is so large compared to um, the number of different var random variables that we have, it doesn't take many random variables to get a good chance of um, two of those or any, any like set of those random variables sharing the same value. And that's one of the biggest implications of our um, birthday paradox is that if you want to prevent collisions from happening, you need to really increase this number of different values that uh, our different values that the random variable can take on, or you need to like have, make sure that the number of random variables we have is very small. So <laughs> like, if you want to make sure that the probability of collision is really small, like the, there's only really two options. And um, the option that's more scalable is decreasing, decreasing, sample numbers, I guess. Decreasing samples, um, rather than the alternative of increasing values, because you need to, you need, like, e even if you're like to, um, make these number of values 10 times larger, uh, that would not really change this num this underlying number of the number of, uh, samples that it can sort of hold uh, as great. And we kind of see this through the fact that we have this exponential relationship of um, probability towards number of samples. Like when I took the exponent, it became um, two is greater than or equal to e to the power of uh, n div times n minus one divided by two times 365. And so 365 is the, um, we'll call this capital N and that's the number of values whereas n is the number of samples, right? And you can kind of imagine that because like this lowercase n is affecting the numerator um, and we have some exponential relationship, it does a much, well, and also this, well, the numerator is being affected by like lowercase n squared where the denominator is just um, one over uppercase n. So obviously as we increase the number of samples where uh, the rate at which the probability is increasing is increasing much larger than the rate at which the probability decreases when we increase uh, the number of total values. So if we want to decrease the probability of collisions out of the two options we have, the better option, which is not always feasible, is to decrease the number of samples. And so this kind of really shows that the number of samples really exad like really increases the chances of any collision. And so before ending, I want to talk about the generalization of the birthday problem. 
And I kind of started introducing that notation earlier. And so we have that the probability, probability of collision. So this is the same thing as probability that at least two of those random variables take on the same value is as we know, one times one minus one over n times um, dot, 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 one minus n minus one divided by capital N. And as we saw before, this, this term over here um, is the same. And we can look at this another way where the um, first order Taylor series approximation for e to the x is simply equal to um, e to the zero, which is one plus um, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Uh, yeah, e to the x times x. And for small values of, well, since x is equal to one in this case, or since x is equal to zero in this case, e to the x is just um, zero, or e to, the, e to the zero is just one. So it's just one plus one times, um, and I think to make things more clear, this x represents the center. So I'll just call this like e to the c. Uh, and yeah, so e to the zero times x. So it's just a, so the first order Taylor series approximation for e to the x is just e to the x is about one plus uh, x. And so these are just approximating um, e to the negative this just represents e to the negative one over n, right? And so what we have essentially is this just being equal to one times e to the negative n times n minus one divided by two uh, n. And that is what we saw before. So this is the generalization of the uh, birthday problem.